أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس كلوا مما في الأرض حلالا طيبا ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين إنما يأمركم بالسوء والفحشاء وأن تقولوا على الله ما لا تعلمون وإذا قيل لهم اتبعوا ما أنزل الله قالوا بل نتبع ما ألفينا عليه آباءنا أولو كان آباؤهم لا يعقلون شيئا ولا يهتدون اللهم اجعلنا من المهتدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ونسجن ورحمة الله وبركاته we're starting from ayah number 168 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And here, after the conversation that we had last week about trendsetters and followers, if you recall, Allah Azza wa had given the warning to those who on Judgment Day, they live their lives following certain people socially and economically in their major decisions. And on Judgment Day, they're hoping that they're only wishing for a chance that they could go back and not have to do that again. Cut those people off like they are cutting themselves off on Judgment Day. Now Allah turns to dunya once again. So there was a scene of the Akhirah, and immediately after that, you're brought back to dunya. And this is actually a very powerful rhetorical mechanism in the Qur'an, that Allah Azza wa will take the believer to a picture of the Akhirah, and then immediately, well now that you've seen this picture, how should your behavior change right now? What should happen to you right now? So it's like, I don't want to be in that situation, so this is what you need to do right away. So there's awamir and nawahi that come right after that. Commands and forbidding statements come right after that picture is shown. Now, in this case, the problem was that of people following others blindly. And this is not just something Muslims do. This is, of course, something that non-Muslims do. And actually, the original context is that of people that are not Muslim refusing to become Muslim. And that's because they're following their ancestry or their social norms or whatever it may be. In our tragic times, this is also a problem of Muslims who refuse to take Islam seriously because of their society, because of their social circle, because of their friends. I mean, I, I met a brother not too long ago, a Muslim brother, whose, you know, whose family hasn't been religious for a couple of generations, right? So they own, like, uh, they own bars, right? And he just, a couple of Ramadans ago, decided that he's just going to take the religion more seriously and for the first time realized that alcohol is haram in Islam. He didn't even know that much. He didn't even know that. So the guy decides he wants to learn more about his own religion. He's Muslim by name. So he decides he's not going to be part of the business anymore and he's not going to drink anymore. His entire family cut him off. His entire, and they, they own several bars across Dallas. Like they're very successful, you know, pub owners. <laughs> you know, and they cut him off entirely. His brother doesn't talk to him. He gets insulted. He goes to his house. He, you know, hands him a beer. He goes, no, I don't want to touch it. You know, and he gets like kicked out of the house. And he's like, he was in serious depression when he came to the masjid. I met him here in Irving at the masjid. You know, the guy was seriously sad because of how his family's treating him, all because he's decided he's not going to follow the way that, you know, they're following. So nowadays we're seeing this problem even with Muslims in whatever capacity. But this ayah is not limited to the problem of Muslims and the pressure they're feeling from the ignorance in their own families, also non Muslims. And the fact that, how intimidating it can be. That's a really loud phone. Okay, so how intimidating, you know, uh, it can be for someone to consider Islam. And think about that even, especially now, in this time, when Islam is like a hot topic and the thing to hate, the fashionable thing to hate is Islam. Imagine in some family, especially in where we, where we are in the South, where loving America is the same as hating Islam for some people, right? You can only have one or the other. In that family, somebody's thinking about Islam. How many times would they think twice before they even, you know, take the leap? Because they know what's going to come with that. Their entire family will come after them, you know? I, uh, there's a sister we knew, uh, she used to teach at a school where I used to work at, and when she became Muslim, uh, her family basically, her, she was from an Italian family in Long Island, and her dad basically told her, you're accepting the religion of the enemy. 
that's what you're doing. Like he just flat out told her. Like that's the kind of pressure that someone would have to face and be ready for when they're turning to this deen. But then Allah Azza wa talks from a different perspective in the coming ayah. He basically talks about one of the things that people that are making you follow their way, what is their way? What does it boil down to? What is it, what's so appealing about their way that they're calling to it that has so much pull that the majority of humanity heads in that direction? He says, Ya ayyuhannas, people, kulu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba. Consume whatever is in, from whatever is in the earth that which is permissible, halal, tayyiban, good and pure. Good, pure, permissible things are what you should be consuming. We think this is a commandment of Allah to the Muslims. But the ayah does not begin, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, it begins, Ya ayyuhal nas. People. People pursue good, pure, permissible things, consume from that. And Allah is teaching us something here, that one of the great benefits of Islam, one of the great goals of Islam, is that we shouldn't, we don't deny the world. It's not like you have to like leave dunya and not enjoy any of it. But you can consume from dunya that which is halal and good and pure. And whatever Allah has made haram for us isn't good for us. And whatever Allah has made halal for us necessarily is better for us, is good for us. So Allah is giving humanity a bit of advice and saying, look, you're going down this road because these, all these people want to do is consume that which isn't halal and isn't tayyib. It's khabith. It's haram and khabith. It's two things. And the opposite of it is halal and tayyib. That's what Allah wants you to consume. I'll tell you a crazy story. I told some of the students this. Just along these lines. I was in Massachusetts two weeks ago in Boston. And I met a brother who, uh, who was a financial analyst. So he used to work in the financial industries to go back and forth between Boston and New York and you know, Wall Street and whatever. Right? So he's a finance guy. And when the subprime mortgage crisis happened... He was so disturbed by how many people lost their homes and I mean he used to invest in some of these firms himself so he knows the in and outs of the financial mecha mechanics. So he starts googling ethical economics. That's what he starts googling. E ethical financing, ethical economics. And some of the first links he finds is Islamic financing, Islamic economics. Like on Wikipedia and other sites. So he starts reading up on that stuff and through just what Islam has to say about economics the halal and tayyib in economics, he became Muslim. Like he became Muslim not because somebody gave da'wah to Islam directly to him, but what he saw was good and pure, something good and pure was being called for in this area that nobody calls for goodness and purity. In, when we talk about economics, everybody talks about the bottom line. Everybody talks about the bottom line. The only ethics they talk about, I, I went to business school, the only ethics they talk about is raise the minimum wage a little so people could pay the rent. And if you, and really, it's not even ethical. They say raise the minimum wage so people pay the rent because if you don't pay the rent, they'll end up doing crimes and go to jail and you won't have a minimum wage employee. So it's good business to raise the wage a little bit. That's their ethics. It's all determined by the bottom line, you know. But this is, Ya أَيُّهَا النَّاسْ كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا And so the call being made to avoid, to, to swim against the tide is to consume that which is good and pure and, and permissible. And here again, a very important comparison. One that Shah Waliullah Dahlbi rahimahullah made. Very wise statement. He said, when Muslims live in a society that is empowered by Islam, then the halal things, the good and pure things are easy to get to. The halal stuff is easy to get to. And the haram things are difficult to get to. Like in a Muslim society, the Muslim would have to make a lot of effort to get to the haram. And everything outside that's available to him would be halal. I know that doesn't work across the board in the Muslim world right now, but at least in terms of what you would call halal food. When you go travel to Saudi, or you travel to a Muslim country, or you know, go to Pakistan, whatever, one of the things that really makes you like, oh my God, this is so much easier, is what? The food is available right there. Even though there are a lot of other haram things, <laughs> right? But at least in terms of food, you taste the ease of Islam. When the Muslims in, in, empower a society with Islam, the halal becomes accessible and the haram becomes Difficult to access. The exact opposite happens in a society that is run by, you know, the, the, the push of shaitan. What, haram in and of itself isn't that attractive. As shaitan makes it attractive. He beautifies it, you know. And when he beautifies it, people pursue it and make it available and they advertise it more and they push it more in your face. So the Muslim in a, in a, in a, in a society that is pushing kufr, is pushing the way of shaitan, they have to go out of their way to find the halal. 
And on the road to finding the halal, along the road, they'll find many, many exits, many offers of the haram, and they have to continuously turn those down and get to the halal. Whether it be finding a spouse, whether it be food, whether it be a job, whether, you, know, you name it, whether it be consumption, whatever it may be. You'll have all these haram options, and you'll have to literally kind of walk through like a minefield to get to the halal option. So halal becomes difficult. One of the goals of you know, the, the victory of the deen is to make the halal easy and the haram difficult. That's what one of its goals is. And now look at the tragedy of the Muslim ummah. I, I'm, I'm from Pakistan. Sometimes my family travels there. You know, I plan on traveling there soon, Allahu alam when. But when my family travels there and I ask them, so how's the, how are the, how's the Muslim society? Like, you know, you know, it's so much easier. My first, you know, premature assumption was it's easy to get away from the haram. You're in a Muslim society. <laughs> what are you talking about? You can't get out of the airport without paying bribes. You can't get anything done without doing something that's questionable in the deen. Every other corner you turn, there's corruption. Every other corner you turn, the haram is staring at you in the face and you can't even go until you slip a little something in. You know, there's a guy, there, there are people going for hajj and they stop by their home country and then they go to hajj. So they go to hajj and they go to their home country and now they're about to go to hajj. So the guy, they know this guy is desperate. He has to make it to, uh, you know, the, the, the sacred land in time. So he hands the guy the passport at the counter and the guy looks at the passport and he opens it up and says, put something in here and close it and then give it to me. Right? Because he knows he has to. So the guy is going to hajj, he has to pay bribes before he goes. You know, لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل. Allah commanded us against this. Don't eat each other's monies using corruption, falsehood. Don't do it. This is يا أيها الناس كلوا مما في الأرض حلالا طيبا. Then Muslims should understand this from another point of view. How many Muslims are so particular? The meat has to be the biha. I respect that a lot. The meat has to be pure. But the money you earned to buy that meat, who cares? The guy owns a liquor store and he will only eat Zabiha meat. The money, the haram money he's taking to, the, to the, 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 the slaughterhouse and he wants to slaughter the animal himself at Eid, that's all great. It's still not halal, bro. It's still not halal. That's not halal food for you. You're feeding your family poison. You're fe what barakah will come out of that money? What barakah will come out of that, that food? This delusional idea that halal is only what is on the outside. It has nothing to do with what we consume even in terms of our income. These things are connected. You can't disconnect them. You know, you can't just take one part of the deen and forget the other part of the deen. SubhanAllah. What hypocrisy is that? So Allah makes a call to all of humanity. And don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Here these people were arguing, we're following our, our forefathers' footsteps. Allah says, actually, no. All of what you're following, when you try to go against the halal, what is that actually? It's the footsteps of shaitan. That's all that is. You don't, don't be confused into thinking that's your tradition, that's your culture, that's your heritage, that this is your pride and your civilization. There's none of that. That's all delusion. What it really is is footsteps of shaitan. إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Certainly he is a clear enemy to you. Yeah, you love your family, you love your tradition, you love your history, but you have to hate shaitan. And if he got, a, got the best of them, he shouldn't get the best of you. Don't let the love of your family tradition allow you to become a friend with shaitan. Don't let those two things get confused with each other. Another very important consideration. You know, sometimes our loved ones, they ask us to do questionable things. Especially for the Muslims nowadays when it comes to weddings is a good example. You know, they ask us to do questionable things. They ask us to, for example, take out a credit card loan or go and over, do an overly extravagant wedding that's going to put everybody in a financial difficulty, then of course the way the party is going to happen is also not exactly going to be halal, you know. And there's going to be, you know, dancing and this and that. And, the, and this is a typical Muslim wedding. You can't even tell the difference between that and a Christian wedding nowadays. Except for the imam that walks in for five minutes and everybody puts the napkin on their head and, you know, except for that part, you can't even tell the difference, right? No, they hire a DJ and everything. I, this, this friend of mine back from college, right? He invited me to his wedding. And I kind of knew that it's going to be a little shady. So I was trying to get out of it somehow because I try not to be part of those kinds of gatherings. But out of respect for the family, I went at least to say salam. And the guy, the DJ he hired, <laughs> the DJ he hired was the owner of the halal meat store. 
Okay, so... <laughs> the guy I buy meat from every week, right? So I walk in, and this guy's like blasting music. He's like in the groove. I'm like, is that you? He sees me, and he puts nasheeds on. <laughs> I'm like, save it, bro. I, whether here, I was here or not, Allah's been here, man. <laughs> you know? And he's just like avoiding eye contact. I'm like, yeah, no. This is, this is too, too awesome. But this is like, you know, and this is at a, at a, a Muslim wedding, right? And I'm not, I'm not passing a fatwa on music or anything, but the kind of gathering, you can tell shaitan's there. You can tell. You can tell when there's no, uh, there are no barriers. There are no restrictions between inappropriate interaction. You know, when Muslim women are, are, are dressed... And they're decked out. Not they can get dressed up for themselves. That's fine. But when they're dressed in a way like, I'm sorry to be offensive, but it looks you know, back home they, the way they dress like elephants, like in Hindu tradition, and they like deck them out in all these fancy colors. They do this with buses in Pakistan. You ever see that? Those crazy colors and bells and whistles hanging. That's how they dress our women. <laughs> you know, they're like this insane colors flashing at you. You know, this is just completely inappropriate for a public setting for a Muslim woman. For a Muslim woman. And when you ask them, why do you do that? They'll tell you, this is how we do things. What are you talking about? This is how everybody... Oh, your uncle had a... Your uncle's sons... Your cousins had a wedding. What are they going to say if we don't have a wedding like this? Why are you so extreme? Why are you so... This is how we do things in our family. And you know what's so funny about that question? If you were to show them a picture of their own grandfather and their own grandmother... Grandpa's got a big old beard and grandma you can't even see her face her face is like the, the, the chadar is hanging over the head You can barely see her face. They're completely modest. I was like, who's, what family tradition are you following? Even these same people that have become so, you know, forward-thinking they call themselves, right? They've become so forward-thinking even in their tradition go a couple of stages back a couple of generations back You'll find Islam This they've abandoned tradition. What they call tradition is is a joke. What tradition is that if not Hindu tradition for us? You know, one of my teachers, uh, uh, Dr. Islam Ahmed Rahimahullah, one of the most painful experiences of his life, he describes it. He was invited also to a wedding. And this wedding was at the border of India and Pakistan. It was a part of Lahore that's kind of touching the border of India. It was a Muslim wedding. So he went there, he was invited, so he went. And he goes and there's this Completely inappropriate gathering, music is blasting, this and that. Asar time comes, nobody even gets up. So he kind of takes one of the tablecloths off the table, puts it on the side, and he starts making salat by himself. And a couple of people joined him. And the groom felt bad, so he joined him too. And he, he, Dr. Saab himself says, I don't think he made wudu. <laughs> but he joins him anyway. And after he finishes making salat, he's looking around. And he's thinking to himself, man, not 50 miles from here, on the other end of the border, there's a Sikh wedding going on. There's a Hindu wedding going on. And there's no difference between these two weddings. You couldn't tell the difference. And he says, so what reason did two, not 50 years have gone by and Muslims drew this line, this border with their blood? That blood hasn't even dried yet. And look at us. They were genera two generations ago, Muslims were staying up all night in countries like Algeria, in countries like Pakistan, in countries like, you know, in Egypt, in all over the Muslim world that were occupied by foreign powers. Muslims would stay up the entire night, not even in Ramadan, every night, collectively making dua, get rid of this evil force that is on us. If you get rid of this force, Ya Allah, we will worship only you. We want our children to be able to say, La ilaha illallah, we will serve your deen. We will show you what Islam really is. Get rid of these evil forces on top of us. And Allah removed many of those forces. And what happened? What, what loyalty did we show Allah? You know? This is the same exact thing Bani Israel had done, by the way. Bani Israel asked Allah for, for you know, relief from oppression. And then Allah, Allah gave them freedom. And then said, let's see what you do. Let's see what, when you get power, let's see how you hold on to power. Let's see what you do with that power. What have the Muslims done? What do we have to show for ourselves? SubhanAllah. We, we, we love talking about politics. Before you talk about bringing about change in the political spectrum, how about we talk about our family situations? How about Islam in the family? And our extended families? Those of you guys that are sitting here in the masjid, probably most of you, you're the weirdos in your family. Right? Most of your families are like, they think religion is a joke. And you guys are extreme, you've lost your way. And they look at you and they laugh. And they say, is that thing is still on your face? 
And they look at your women and they say, you're still wearing that thing? You're going to go to the Eid party looking like that? Might as well not come. That's how they'll talk to you. That's your own family. You know? This is the crazy situation we're in. We have to convince the Muslims to go to halal and tayyib. And here Allah is talking to all of humanity and saying, كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّمَا إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُوءِ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ He's only commanding you to evil, su. One of the great commentaries on su and al-fahsha. Al-fahsha means shamelessness. And su is evil. One thing is, or, 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 or bad things. Shamelessness is a part of evil. So one observation of Sha'arawi rahimahullah makes is, the fact that Allah mentioned evil and then separately mentioned al-fahsha is because this is the number one thing he'll call you. Of all the list of evil things he'll make you do, he'll make you do evil things out of greed, he'll make you do evil things out of jealousy, he'll make you do evil things out of many reasons. But the number one thing that, will he, that he will use against you to make you do evil deeds over and over and over again will be al-fahsha, your temptations, your lust, your desire. That's Fahsha literally an act that is lewd, it's vile, it's inappropriate. That's what it is. And it's closest in Arabic root systems to the word wahsh, which is a wild animal. Right? It's a difference of one letter, fa and wa. That's the only difference. Fahsh and wahsh. You know? That's what he'll call you to do, to become shameless. To become shameless. You know, what, what, when we, call, we talk about modernizing the Muslim world, there are some values of the Western world that are amazing. Corruption is all over the world. Let's not be naive. There's corruption here, there's corruption everywhere. But the, the, the level of transparency that is found in Western governments, we're not even close, we're, we're hundreds of years away from that in Muslim governments. There's a reason all of, many of us move here, because there are, if you actually put work in, you have an opportunity to earn a decent living. And if you did the same amount of work somewhere else in the Muslim world, depending on the color of your skin or the kind of connections you have and this and that, you wouldn't get that opportunity. People can buy your degree. People can buy your job, depending on their connections. There's a reason where, you know, there's some elements of justice here that we, we appreciate. So when Muslims see that, they say, we need to get modern too. We need to modernize ourselves. In some sense, I agree. I agree. Our infrastructure needs to improve. The way we deal with water supply, the way we deal with sanitation, the way we deal with recycling, the way we deal with road systems, the way we deal with security. These things need to be upgraded and we have something to learn from the West, absolutely. But then you know what we do? We don't learn any of that from the West. All the good stuff. We don't learn any of that. But we do learn the jeans and the sneakers. And we do learn the MTV and the VH1. And we do learn the movies. And we do learn all the stuff we, that you, will give you no good. <laughs> you learn. So when somebody says they're westernized, that basically means they're shameless. And they took none of the good from the society. The corruption is all still there. <laughs> the, ethical, the unethical practices are all still there. And all the things that aren't commendable, the things that we are trying to, you know, there are wonderful things about this society, and then there are things we have to save ourselves and our kids from. And what's happening in the Muslim world, all over, and even here for the Muslims, we take all the things we're not supposed to from this society, and we don't learn from any of the things we're supposed to learn from. One of the great values of this country and this society is that it's disciplined. There's discipline. When you go to McDonald's, you can't cut a line. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO of IBM or the janitor at IBM. It doesn't matter. When you're in line, you're in line. It doesn't matter what kind of thing you're wearing on your head or what royal family you belong to. You're going to stay in line. Everybody's equal. And nobody can respect the, disrespect the guy behind the counter because every in that sense, everybody's equal. You go to the Muslim world, you're going to find that. You're going to find... <laughs> You know, one of my uncles decided I can't deal with the you know, kafir society over here. I'm going, to, I'm going to move my kids to a Muslim society because I want them to be around Islam. He came back in six months. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. He was standing in a post office and some dude from the royal family walks up, cuts everybody in line and starts chit-chatting with the guy. And he says, what are, you, what are you doing? And you're not even supposed to make eye contact with the guy because he'll get you in serious trouble. It's like, well, what is this? What kind of Islam is this? You know, then he goes literally. He goes to pa a friend of mine goes to Pakistan, and he's ordering food at a restaurant. And you know these these restaurants, these waiters are really poor people, really really poor people. He sees an SUV pull up, a 13 year old kid, 13 12 year old kid rolls his tinted window down. He's listening to Fifty Cent. He goes, oh, come here. He's talking to the 60 year old waiter like, come here. And he's talking to him like he's, he's dirt. Like that. And that's yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. And he goes and brings the tea, he takes a sip, put some sugar in there. 
And he's cursing. This kid is cursing him out. And nobody's bothered by that. Nobody's bothered. Because that guy is supposed to be lower class. You're supposed to talk to him like that. What? What, what has happened to the Muslim Ummah? Where we can live like that and not even be bothered by it. It doesn't even, you don't even flinch. And the only reason the Muslims from here, when they go, they're bothered by it, is because they got used to being treated with respect. They got used to that. And the only thing of the West that that kid could take is 50 cent. That's the only thing you could take. A hat on, a, a baseball hat on sideways. That's the only thing you got from America. <laughs> you know, subhanAllah. This is, if this is not khutuwat shaitan what is it? This is the pathetic state of the ummah. The pathetic state. And we have an opportunity. Muslims in the West actually have, we're sitting on a colossal opportunity. We can take the best of a society and bring to it also the best of Islam. And we can show how those two things don't contradict each other. That's the other movement in the world today. The enemies of Islam are pushing it. Some liberal crazy elements are pushing it. What, what idea they're pushing? You can't get ahead in the world and have Islam at the same time. You can't do, those two things don't miss, mix. If you want to be pre-modern and like barbaric and ancient, then you concern yourself with Islam. If you want to be with the times, then you have to leave Islam. There are two contradictory things. We're sitting on that golden opportunity. We have to show that, that that's not the case. That these two things come together in a person, you know? So this is وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّمَا إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُّوءِ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ وَأَنْ تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And when you start following this stuff, then shaitan will take the next step. If you listen to him a little bit with su, then you fell even worse and you listen to him when fahsha. The word yatmuru doesn't just mean command, it also means suggest. So he starts by suggesting these things to you. You take a suggestion, then he suggests you even strongly. He has more authority over you. And then as you listen to him more and more, you're basically becoming more and more controlled by shaitan. That's what happens to a person. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانِ My slaves, you will have no authority over them. No doubt about it. You know what that means? People who actually worship Allah and enslave themselves to Allah, shaitan has no control over them. He could try to give them waswasa, but he fails. But then there's a person who gives waswasa to a believer, and the believer fails and listens to it and does something wrong. The next time the waswasa is even stronger, has more of an effect. The third time it has more of an effect. Until you find a young person coming to the imam and saying, Ya imam, I do this wrong thing. I can't even help myself. I don't even know how to control myself. It's like I'm not even in my own control. That is when you know shaitan has gained control. He's given himself up. He's like, he's crying. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to stop. It's like, I can't, I'm not even in control anymore. They'll admit that to you. Addicts. They'll admit that to you. Completely give it into shaitan. And when you're completely give it into shaitan, you know what the next step, step, step is? The worst crime he can get you to do is to com commit a crime against Allah. Su is a crime against yourself. Fahsha is a crime against somebody else. But the worst crime is against Allah. He gets you to that point. And taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. He'll get you to say things against Allah that you have no knowledge of. Somebody will come and try to say to you, brother, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't. Allah never says that. Where does he say that in the Quran? Show me. You're misinterpreting it. You start talking like that. You start speaking on behalf of what Allah says. You start justifying your behavior. Start using the religion and your twisted interpretation of religion just to, just to be able to say, yeah, I'm not contradicting Islam. You're just interpreting it in a narrow-minded way. I've got a broad-minded interpretation. When Allah says haram, what He really means is things that make you feel bad. You know, that's what He really means. You'll come up with your own flowery interpretation that, that justifies everything you do. What's the driving force behind it though? You don't want to change yourself. You want to do what you want to do. You don't want to stick to the halal. You want to make more and more of it, you know, open, more, more and more of what shaitan is offering to you, justifiable to you. And you're going to use the religion to justify it, subhanAllah. And taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. Last ayah for the evening, inshaAllah. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا اِتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ When they're told, when it is said to them, follow what Allah has sent down. Come back to the origin. You want to follow something? What could be more worthy of being followed than what Allah sent down? You're telling me I'm following this because my parents handed this down to me. My ancestors handed this down to me. My culture is this way. Times have changed. The, the logic is the, is, the words change, but the logic is the same. Now it is youth to tell you, everybody's doing it. They won't say my forefathers did it because now it's not fashionable anymore, right? Well, I'm doing this because my dad did it. Actually, now the thing to do is do the opposite of what your dad did. That's, that's what we do as youth, right? So your new argument is everybody's doing it. What's your problem? 
Was everybody crazy and you're the only one that makes sense? That's the new logic. So the argument by Allah is, why don't you follow the thing that deserves to be followed the most? What Allah sent down. Qalu, they'll, they'll respond, بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَنَا We're only going to follow what we stumbled our fathers following, stumbled upon. Alfa, to find something after stumbling upon it. Meaning, we happen to be from this tradition, there's no reason for us to, to violate that. We happen to be part of this society, this ancestry, we're going to stick to what we have, we're happy with where we are. No thank you. No thank you. We don't need to follow anything else. أَوَلَوْ كَانَ أَبَاؤُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْئًا أَوَلَوْ كَانَ You know, it wasn't it the case that their forefathers, their ancestors, didn't understand anything? Allah is saying, you weren't around when your ancestors made these mistakes, which you're calling tradition. Allah was shahid. Allah, was shahid. Allah watched it. Allah is saying, wasn't it the case that your forefathers didn't even understand a thing? They were dumb. When they did this, they were stupid. Nor were they committed to guidance. They were not committed to guidance at all. The word aql here, I'm reminding you, we talked about this before, to not think clearly and to let your emotions and your whims make the decisions for you. That is, that is the opposite of aql jahl. Allah says, لا يعقلون شيئا They had no restraints. They didn't use their intellect at all. This is where they come up with these traditions. And they weren't committed to the idea, they weren't committed to guidance. They didn't want to stick to a path. You know, this is, this is not what their forefathers were. Allah goes and directly attacks the ancestry. He directly attacks it. The last comment I'll make about this inshallah ta'ala and I'll close. You know, we are, uh, especially the, the Muslims that are listening here, that come from any other part of the world than Arabia. If you're not from Hijaz, then you and I came to Islam through our forefathers who came into contact with Islam through the da'wah of somebody. So I, for instance, I, I'm of you know, Pakistani origin and originally of Afghani origin, three, four generations back. My ancient ancestors are not Muslim. They were pagans. The Muslims made hijrah to that land and, and made da'wah to Islam, to pagans. And those, my great, great, so there's somebody up there in my lineage who used to be an idol worshiper and some Muslim came and made da'wah to him and he abandoned all of his traditions for Islam. And I'm sure he suffered a lot for it. And today his kids upon kids upon kids upon kids upon kids, upon kids are saying La ilaha illallah because of one decision he made. And he's reaping the benefit of all of those people that became Muslim because of him. One day when I, my, one of my wishes, may Allah enter all of us into Jannah, is to go into Jannah and look up that ancestor and say, Thanks, granny, granddad, great grandpa, you know, that was, that was some good stuff. Tell me that story. I'd like to know. But I'm bringing this up for a reason. That one decision to not follow tradition and come to Islam is benefiting so many. And imagine if he didn't make that decision. Imagine if that person doesn't make that decision. Then the shirk of those following generations falls on whose head? Those mushrikun's head themselves and his head. They will carry their own load and another load on top of their own load. It's not like they're gonna, their children will not be blamed. They'll be blamed too. But he'll take their load on top of that. It's enough for a mushrik to burn in hell for his own shirk. Now he's paying for the shirk of his future generations. So imagine, Muslims now, us. We set a trend of making the haram okay in our family. The haram is no big deal in my family. When your, for your children, when the haram is no big deal. And for their children, the haram is no big deal after that. Even the, the door, even, you open the door a little bit, your children will open it a little more, and after that there won't even be a wall. Forget door. Who's going to be paying the price for that? On judgment day, just think about that. This, this, this ancestry that you take pride in, Allah has made that a liability on the head of a Muslim. It's a liability. We have to think about how we're going to raise our kids because it's not just our kids. It's 5, 6, 7, 10, 20, 30, 40 generations from now. However Allah keeps this earth going, all of those future decisions will have an, are impacted by how we raise our children. What a heavy load we're carrying. That's why Allah makes us, He teaches us this dua. رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Make us imam over muttaqeen. On, on judgment day, all of us, all of the heads of the households were raised as imams. And these imams have chains on them. 
and by your chain, the people who you were in charge of are chained to you. And if those people are righteous and they're, they reach a higher status than you, they're raising you with them. But if they're going down because of the, your lack of responsibility, well, you're getting dragged down with them. It's a serious, serious concept. So we didn't just ask to be made imam, we, we asked to be made imam over muttaqeen, over righteous people, over people of taqwa. It's a very serious responsibility that's being discussed in these ayat. With the, 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 the clash between following tradition and following our deen and its consequences in the future. Everybody cites the past. Everybody says, I'm doing this because the past has been done like this. That's why I'm doing it too. I'm saying we have to think about the future. Forget the past. Allah says, forget the past. They didn't understand anything. They didn't understand anything. You need to think about your future. Last comment, I promise. Your, the, the, the Muslim family you have, Muslim family you have that wants to turn you away, away from the deen, you know what they tell you? Think about your future. That's what they tell you. Why are you going to the masjid? Think about your future. Why are you looking like that? Think about your future. Why did you turn that job down? Yeah, it's, it's in this questionable industry Islamically, but I'm sure you'll find a fatwa on Google. Think about your future. They'll tell you that. They'll tell you to compromise your deen. And every time they offer you a justification, they'll say, I'm worried about your future. And your response should be, I'm more worried about my future. You're only thinking of my future for the next 10 years. I'm thinking about a life, like an endless lifetime. I'm worried about my future. That's why I'm doing this. So we have to think big. <laughs> we have to start thinking bigger. And that concern that people have, they're really not thinking about your future. They're thinking about tomorrow. We're thinking about the day after tomorrow. That's how we have to think. May Allah Azza wa Jal open, open our eyes to the reality around us and give us all the ability to become, to become people of the right path and raise families that are on the right path. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.